Okay, last part, univalence. So let's look at function extensionality. We said that function extensionality means that if I have pointwise equivalence of maps, which is this thing here, that's the pointwise equivalence of maps, then I actually get an equivalence. But we can do better. There is a particular map which goes from equality to equivalence, pointwise equivalence, um, you, that you construct by, by, by path induction. And you say that map is an equivalence. That's the true nature of function extensionality. Whenever in homotopy type theory, you are tempted to say that two things are equivalent, you should stop and think, maybe I really want to say that a particular map which I have is an equivalence. And typically this is the map that is the easy direction. So it's easy to show that if you have a path from F to G, then for all X, you have a path from F of X to G of X. That's easy. The other way is not doable without further assumptions in Martin Love type theory. Oh, by the way, I said I was going to tell you when we leave Martin Love type theory behind and extend it with something. If you extend Martin Love type theory with function extensionality, then you're going to step outside of MLTT proper. And uh, for homotopy type theory, we're now going to state univalence and that's then homotopy type theory. Okay, so, um, <coughs> so the better way to say is that you should always think about whether maybe you want to say that some particular map is an equivalence rather than just say, oh, any equivalence. Although often it's an interesting question to ask if I have some equivalence, then is the map of interest also an equivalence? And that's uh, good to know because that can make your life easier. Anyhow, uh, right now we're just looking at the fact that function extensionality is something that it explains what the identity type on functions is. It, this really, the way you should read this is you say, okay, I have the path space between F and G. What's it really like? And the answer is saying, well, it's equivalent to this other thing, which only involves paths in the codomain. So in a way, it's simplifying, it's, it's decomposing the path space. It's telling you something useful about the path space because now you know that in order to construct a path from F of G, you can also just inhabit this pi type. And that's useful to know. It's quite similar, say, with products. With products, you say, well, but how do I prove that U and V, which are elements of A cross B, are equal? And you can prove that uh, <laughs> this space, this path space, is equivalent to the Cartesian product of two path spaces. Notice I don't have to, I don't have any problems with transport on pi two because I took a simple product here. So I don't have to worry about transport. So this again is helpful because it computes the identity type in a way. It says, here's the identity type on the Cartesian product. Actually, it's equivalent to this other thing. So now I know how to prove that U and V are equal. I do it component wise. Now, another way to view these useful equivalences and by the way, there's still going to be here a particular map, which is in one of the earlier exercises that goes from left to right is the easy one. And then the, the, to go backwards, you need to work a little bit. So all of these, these, both of these are in a sense, extensionality principles. Now, what is an extensionality principle? In, in set theory, extensionality means that a set is determined by its elements. There is nothing more to the set than it's element hood relation. So if you think of the what is the behavior of a set? Well, the behavior of a set is determined by its elements because the only thing you can really ask about a set is what are, it, what are its elements. So the components, the extension of a set determines the set itself. Function extensionality is called extensionality for a similar reason. The extent of the function it be, can be, you can think of it as the components, the parts that make the function. Well, the parts that make the function are its values. So if two functions have the same values, then they're the same function. It's an extensionality principle of a similar kind as with sets. If two sets have the same extension, that is to say the same elements, then they're the same set. This, and the same goes for ordered pairs. Here it's even more explicit. It says ordered pairs are equal 
if their parts are equal, the parts are the extension, it's what it, right? So these are extensionality principles and they're helping us compute identity types. The way that they are manifested in homotopy type theory is that they state that certain identity types equal something else in a useful way. Okay, do we have such a principle for the universe? This is an interesting question. You can now ask for, you know, extensionality principle for sums and products and la la la, and you compute and you get answers. But the one that is sort of a lot more interesting is how about the universe? Can we say something about when two types are connected with a path? If I have two types in a universe, what does it mean for them to be connected with a, with, with a map? And again, we should, uh, what we should shoot for is we should shoot for some map that is easy, which gets us from equivalence to somewhere else. So, oh, sorry, from path to somewhere else. If I have a path from F to G, then I get some element here. If I have a path from pairs, then I get these two paths. So let's first try to do the same for universes. So here's a good candidate. We can define by path induction, a map which converts, which converts, which goes from the identity type. So it goes from paths, oops, to equivalences. This is a B here. So it goes from paths to equivalences. How does it work? Okay, well, this is just straight path induction. It says you have one endpoint in the universe, you have another endpoint in the universe, you have an arbitrary path between them. Hey, can you get me this thing here? Because this is just an abbreviation. By the way, this is an abbreviation for this thing here. It's just an abbreviation for pi p is a path and now give me an equivalence. Okay, um, you define it by path induction by fixing both endpoints to be the same and taking here the identity path. So I just need to explain what this thing does in case I have uh, both endpoints are the same in the identity path, but then I'm asked to show, I'm asked to provide an equivalence from A to A. Well, that's easy. Oh, sorry, actually it's gonna be from C to C. So here I need an element that is an equivalence from C to C. So that's just the identity map on C together with the proof that the identity map actually is an equiv. So here I need something that's a, that proves is equiv the identity map on C and I'm not going to write it down. <laughs> this is quite often, by the way, that uh, when you have an element of a proposition you start dropping it and you don't write it down because all you care is that it's there. It doesn't, you can't make a mistake by picking the wrong one. So people tend to just drop them after a while. Um, it's maybe better in the beginning to at least be aware of the fact that they're there. Um, okay, so that's an easy map. And so that gives us a straight forward candidate for what we should say we should just say that this map is an equivalence and that is going to be an extensionality principle for universes. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say that a universe is univalent if this map that is constructed here is an equivalence. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable candidate for what would be an extensionality principle for you. Mind you, this is not the only candidate because maybe somebody is going to say, how about if here instead we used This one, that is to say isomorphism instead of equivalence, wouldn't that work as well? Well, I think that's probably an exercise in the hot book. It's not so obvious, but this leads to trouble. This leads, you can't do this. This leads to contradiction. So uh, it's, it's a bad thing. So here, here's actual some, there's here, here there's some actual wisdom. It's not all just automatic. Um, it's, it's, I think, I would say 15 years ago, it would be easy to not be able to uh, realize that even there is a significant difference between the two notions and that, well, that either one of them is a reasonable extensionality principle for universes. So what is the, um, 
the way that you can remember this, you see very often up here, we say, well, this is equivalent to that. When we really mean is the easy map going from left to right is an equivalence. We don't here mean any equivalence. We have a specific one in mind. So here the same, the exact statement of uni that the fact that U is univalent is that this map is an equivalence, but the way people remember it instead is that you just say identity type is equivalent to equivalence, or you would say path types in the universe are equivalent to equivalences. But this is this is kind of cooler, right? Identity is equivalent or equality. Identity is equivalent to equivalence. That's how you can remember it. And the axiom of univalence says that every universe is univalent. However many you have, they're univalent. But you can also uh, do homotopy type theory where you are not so absolute and you say, you study what happens if I have a universe U, which is univalent, but then it's in a larger universe, which maybe is not univalent. Everything is possible. The important thing is to understand that this is like an extensionality principle for universes because it says that equal types behave the same way in the sense that they're equivalent. Yes? That's what's important about it. Um, in practice, how is this used? Well, this is the easy map. Always these principles, the way that they are useful is that because the easy map going from left to right is an equivalence, it has an inverse. It's that inverse that does, a real, that does real work. It was just like earlier here in, the, uh, here in the universal property, we get the easy map E, which is super easy. But then once we look at its inverse, when we state that it's an equivalence, its inverse is doing the hard part. It's the one that's producing the thing that's supposed to exist. Yes? So it's the same here. The inverse to the inverse to this easy map is the one that's going to be interesting. So what does it do? Well, the inverse will take, it goes in the other direction. So it converts equivalences to paths. And it's typically called UA for univalence axiom. Okay, we have a question. How does one ensure consistency of such axioms? I will address this, but there will be much more addressing of this, I think, on Wednesday because uh, um, we were going to have an entire talks about models of, okay, so I can just answer the question. Models of uh, homotopy type theory, which validate this, these axioms are known. The first one was given by Vladimir Vavotsky and it was the simplicial sets. And then later, um, um, who was it? Um, Tariko Khan and Mark Bezem and Simon Huber, I think they gave the, they gave the, um, the cubical models and so on. So now, nowadays we have, we have more than one model of this, so we know it's consistent. Um, we have another question. What happens if one just assumes the axiom that every equivalence between A and B yields a path between A and B? That is to say, you just assume that you have a map going from here to there without assuming this function to be an equivalence. Does this provide a meaningful extensionality? Okay, so what I think if I understand you correctly, is that if you assume that there is a map going from equivalences to paths, but not anything else, right? That's your point. Then in particular, yeah, okay. So that's like assuming half of something, right? But then you have to think carefully, what did you assume? So it was something like a weak thing, right? You don't know that, they, that, you don't know that it's unique in any way, and you're not going to be able to compute anything. You won't know how it behaves. In particular, you're not going to have this thing below here. So I haven't really thought about this, but people have, I'm sure this is transport. Uh, people have thought about this, um, probably that if you have a map like this, how far does it get you? I don't have a, an answer on the fly, but it's something to discuss on Discord maybe. Okay, so uh, what does the inverse do? Well, the inverse is going to, convert uh, is going to convert equivalences to paths. But that's, so it's called UA for univalence axiom. So you give it, you give it an equivalence and it produces a path. Uh, but you see, that's, it's, it, so this is the same story repeating over and over in type theory. You give a construction, you give something, you're usually not done. You also want an equation. 
You define the constructors and destructors of a type, pairing and projections, you are not done. You want the equations. You define lambda, you have, you, you produce, you know, you, you postulate lambda abstraction and application, you're not done. Here is the same. Uh, okay, we have a map, we have a map that's producing paths. So what? Well, so we want to know something about these paths apart from the fact that they're there. And so what they are saying, what is, what, what's going on is that the way the path transports is the same that E works. So let's draw a picture here. So what we have is we have A. Uh, so, okay, so let's be careful. So here, so I'll draw a picture of the universe. How's that? Um, here's my universe U. Here is the type A as a point. Here is the type B as a point. Above this, I have the type A as a type, not just a point. And here is B as a type. And so now if I have, a, I have an equivalence E between them here. So, but here I have a path which is called UA of E. So if I take something in here, an X, I can get to it in two ways. I can get to it by applying E and I will get E of X, or I can take this path. Now my type just got too small. Okay, here's my type B. You think of this as sitting over A and this is sitting over B, it's the fiber. So I have this one, but I can also have UA of E transported, right? So the transport, these two will have a path. There will be a path between, between these two. That's what is a useful bit that lets me calculate using univalence. Okay, what's going on? Uh, Valeri says, you can show that concatenation of paths corresponds to composition of equivalences, but you cannot show this with the weaker assumption. There you go. So uh, Valeri gave an answer to Dominic who asked, what happens if you just assume that you have this map, but nothing else? For instance, you don't know how to calculate these things. And you don't the next reply contradicts that. Say again? The next reply contradicts that. Ah, okay. So now well, let's just read what people said so that it's on video. So Valeri said, you can show that concatenation of paths corresponds to composition of equivalences, but you cannot show that if you just have a map and you know nothing about it. And then Ellis says, not exactly the same, but exercise 2.6 of the hot book states that if you assume just half of function extensionality, I just assume that you have a some any function which goes from pointwise in the difficult direction, then you can deduce that the whole function, all of function extensionality. Uh, okay, but I think Valeri was uh, maybe referring to how univalence, uh, how univalence interacts with composition of equivalences, whereas Ellis is saying that there is a useful uh, exercise about function extensionality. So. Just off the top of my head, I'm not going to say that they are contradicting each other. I don't see that immediately. We have Discord. We can discuss on Discord until midnight. Okay, so what are some consequences of univalence? Here, there, here are some consequences. First of all, as already stated, function extensionality, and that's not the sort of thing you do in two minutes, but since the first proofs have been given of this fact, that they have been greatly simplified and made pedagogical and so on. So nowadays you can find nice proofs. Um, they used to be horrible. <laughs> okay. Um, it allows us to do things like uh, compute homotopy groups. And we will see that on, on Friday, a little bit of that, I hope. Uh, I think the, that Egbert is planning to calculate the homotopy group of the circle. So without, without univalence, Things are kind of undetermined. You have no idea what the space, what the universe looks like. At least you don't know what its paths look look like. And so then, then things get sort of undetermined. You can't really say anything. Um, so that's why uh, this is useful. And then it implies things. It, it it sort of bolts things down. 
univalence gives lots of answers. You see, if you have just a multi martin love type theory and you start asking questions about universes, equality of types in the universe, equality of functions, you don't get any answers. It's underspecified in the sense that it's very general and it allows many other kinds of interpretations of what type theory is about and they will give different answers. So it's, it's every, lot, lots of things are not determined. But univalence answers an amazing amount of, of, of questions. It gives function extensionality. You can compute homotopy groups. It implies that things are non-trivial. For instance, it's, it shows that the, the, the type of sets in a given universe, so what is this set U? The set U is those types in the universe U, which are a set. Um, that's going to be a groupoid as opposed to a set, for instance. That's what univalence implies. Um, I think that's an exercise down here. Yes. Um, another one is, you, you see here you say, okay, you solve the question about when two types are equal, but what I really care about is when are two groups equal? Or how about if, when are two vector spaces equal? Or some other richer structures, when are two categories equal? Or given two objects in a category that are isomorphic, are they equal? So these are all very, these are all questions which are of the same kind. You have some structures and you would like to relate their equality with their equivalence. You have a notion of equivalence and you would like to relate that. But univalence just does that for bare types, just for bare types A and B. What if A and B have some extra structure? Okay, then what? Well, then univalence will also answer these sorts of questions and it'll answer them in, them in a very nice way. They will say, yes, isomorphic groups are equal or rings or modules. Here it's important that these are sets. And so then isomorphism and equivalence are the same thing. So this you can look up in a book under structure identity principle and many, many more such things happen. So that's why univalence, the univalence axiom is interesting. It's mathematically interesting because it has very nice consequences. And also it embodies an intuition which is difficult to um, uh, formalize, namely that we can treat uh, equivalent structures as if they were equal. Mathematicians do this all the time, but it's, this is the first formalization which makes that successful in a sort of a grandiose way, which allows you to work with this very nicely, which is not maybe a little limited. It's, it just works uh, all the time. It requires to, uh, you to do make a, a, some adjustments, adjustments like what is equality about, it's about paths and so on, but nevertheless, it does that. Okay, so it's 1820. There are some exercises here, which since we're going to do the exercises and then everybody's going to disappear for today, um, I'm going to, we're just going to do this usual thing of you know, talking a little bit about the, ex, about the exercises in breakout rooms. But before we do that, I think Mathieu would like to have a word, but before I, Mathieu does that, there are still some questions here. Okay, so what are they? Uh, Simon has shown in his thesis that weak univalence does not imply fully univalence. There we go. Nicola has an answer to the question. Um, and then does univalence make, uh, this is Violeta, does univalence make the vibration over U with fiber over A, the type A more special in an easy, oh, okay, Oof, this is complicated. Okay, uh, Violeta, I would like to take this to Discord because I would like to understand what you're saying. Maybe if you can ask there in the chat uh, for day one. Stefan, any known application of univalence to program verification? Uh, people have been trying to do things with some success. Maybe there is a, um, I would say the following. The idea to treat equality as, homo, as a homotopical notion that gives, that has spilled over to uh, more computer science applications of type theory in giving people ideas on how to tackle and define things. So even if you don't get the exact full application of univalence, there will still be useful things. So one, for instance, to look at is the two-dimensional type theory by 
uh, CMU people. Which CMU people is it? The two-dimensional type theory. Bob Harper and and Dan Nikata. And Dan Nikata. Okay, so that will be a, a place to look because that one gives you a mar much more computational kind of thing where you can see how you how things compute. Okay. Um, Sometimes when you do program verification, you may have two, two definitions of an object and one might be more practical to prove a theorem with the other might be more practical for computation. Univalence, univalence tells you that any property you prove for one is valid for the other. That is a good point, uh, which works well. Uh, it kind of gets nasty if you're trying to use univalence to transfer something that is supposed to compute from one place to another because then you have to understand how univalence transforms computation. But you're correct that as long as it's just for properties and you don't care how they compute, then, you, then that can be quite helpful. Okay, now I think we've exhausted, no, we haven't. How do you define a category in hot? Look into the hot book chapter 10. Okay, or ask me, Jure, because Jure is my student, so he can just ask me, uh, okay. Chapter nine. Chapter nine, <laughs> sorry, chapter 10. Yes, did you ever notice that in the hot book, the mathematics part, the second part, it's backwards, right? It goes homotopy theory, category theory, set theory, real numbers, right? That's backward, that numbers. That's completely backwards from one people, how people uh, learn mathematics. It's, it's the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, hello, I, I have a question that I put in the chat. Can univalence tell us, like give us, uh, for say two given, say descriptions of groups that are isomorphic. Oh, uh, can uh, oh, can 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 we then understand what what is what are the paths between those two groups? Well, the paths will the paths between those two groups will be the space of paths between those two groups will be equivalent to the space of isomorphisms between those two groups. That is probably the best answer I can give on the spot like that. In a way to know that, the, see, I, I kept saying this, to know that the identity type is equivalent to something else, that is the way that you can answer the question, what is the, ident what is the path space like? If you ask me, what is the path space between two groups like? My, my answer will take the form of an equivalence. My answer, I, I want to answer it by saying the space, the path space between two groups is equivalent to, and then give you a description that will tell you something useful. So in this case, it's equivalent to the, the space of isomorph group, homo, group isomorphisms between them. So that's the answer I would give. Is there a formulation of UA for classical set theory or UA is trivial in some sense or not required for sets? UA is useful for set theory because the universe of sets is a groupoid. And so some interesting paths appear there. And that's one of the exercises which apparently we're not going to do too much. Um, that it, it helps you, univalence helps you understand sometimes um, uh, also things which normally you wouldn't think of having a, a rich structure. So here's another one. But notice that univalence is always has something to do with universes and paths between universes. This first exercise is like that. You have to use univalence to show that the type of true propositions is contractible because you have to understand what are paths between propositions. And even though propositions are very boring, Univalence still gives, still gives you an answer on what the paths are. Well, the paths are equivalent to equivalences between propositions, but you know what equivalence of propositions are, and so then you can use that. Okay, uh, is univalence constructive? Okay, I suggest I just keep answering these questions and maybe these exercises turn into a homework. How do you, do you I think that's better. So um, we have a question, is univalence constructive? This was not quite a million dollar question, but certainly a question for eternal fame because the first model that Voivodsky gave of showing that univalence is consistent was, uh, was um, simplicial sets using classical set theory. 
and so it wasn't clear that univalence can be made constructive and this was very early on um, a big question which was then solved by the people who i mentioned earlier who gave the cubical sets model the point was that they knew how to make the cubical sets constructive and i think even today is not entirely clear or maybe nicola did that on how to make simplicial sets constructive but the answer is yes univalence is known to be constructive at least in, in several in the sense that we have good good computational models of univalence and you will see these in this school because cubical agda is about that and we have eric who is saying hey if you want to know applications of univalence to program verification check out some stuff what is the stuff it's a paper by okay you can click on it in chat um anything else before we give uh, uh, any other questions maybe just like one last sentence what you should take from this to, from this day it was too much stuff to absorb in that one day i'm totally aware of that not only that i also made mistakes so everything was confusing so what do you take from this so i think the way the, the, the thing to take away with here the most important one is type theory is a theory of constructions and we can think of it in this geometric way that is that that brings in homotopy uh, type homotopy theory and this has many applications and then from the technical point of view the things to remember were that you can do lots of things with equivalences and that univalence answers a lot of questions a lot of questions so 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 that's one reason why it's good okay now i'm done thank you for your attention and we'll have 